So, uh, first of all, I uh, want to give Rob Flory a photo credit for this picture, which I really like. And, and the question here is, what, what could be better than listening to radio on a radio that you built except maybe winning the DX contest with the radio you built. Yeah. That's, a, that's another, another issue. So tonight we're going to talk about homemade radios as a lead-in to the home brew contest, which will be judged at the meeting in April. So you still have time to plan and get a radio together and build something. And building radios is one of the historic traditions of the ball of radio history. I mean, back in the 20s, if you didn't have the money to, to go out and buy a set, you went down to W.T. Grant, bought parts, and built one. And you can still do that because it's pretty simple. And if you've never built a radio, uh, now it's, now's the time to start. You've put it off long enough, and uh, it's easy enough to do. So, you start out with the concept. <laughs> you get that flash of inspiration. <laughs> My God, I'm going to build an 18 tube super heavy with the DX So, where, where do we get the inspiration that causes 201As to appear above our head in, in a blinding flash? Well, there's a lot of stuff around, and especially the old magazines are useful. Quite a number of old books around. And nowadays, there is all kinds of material on the web. So source material should be no real problem. Uh, I kind of like this cover. In the old days, they never talked about circuits. They talked about hookups. And um, this was one of the Burns back things from 1923. And in the old magazines, you'll find construction articles with schematics and uh, go back and wiring diagrams and whatnot. And so it's really not too difficult. One, the challenge is to round up the parts, basically. But uh, I'll make some suggestions about simple ways to do this. Um, here's a simple radio that comes out of popular radio back in the 20s. Uh, don't worry too much about the circuit, but, but the point we want to make here is that when you do this, you're going to be fulfilling several roles. You're going to be the engineer, you're going to be the draftsman, you're going to be the technician that wires it up, and you're going to be the, the craftsman that builds the chassis and does the mechanical assembly, so you get to do the whole thing. Uh, and the first thing you want to do, because you're going to be substituting parts, maybe <laughs> merging a couple of designs, you may be doing something sort of from scratch. So you want to breadboard your circuit first. And here's John V. L. Hogan, which was kind of an interesting guy, uh, but he wrote for the radio magazines back in the 20s. And here's a picture of him checking out a circuit. He's just got his parts distributed on the tabletop. Uh, clip leads are your best friend. And you can get the thing going, make sure it's going to work, make sure your coil has the right number of turns relatively, and things like that. So by all means, breadboard first. Uh, you can take a piece of wood, put a little bit of a panel on the front of it, hold your tuning capacitor, because that will be annoying if it's flopping around on the table. John has an old-fashioned uh, guy there that's in a, one of those round containers. But uh, by all means, breadboard first, and then you won't be disappointed. Uh, I think a lot of people look at a set of plans, get the parts together, and start drilling and blasting a chassis and putting it together, and then it doesn't work, and you know, the whole thing kind of comes apart on them. So take it a step at a time. And uh, I'm going to suggest a sample thing for a first-time builder, and we're going to take it progressive steps. And the, the goal here is to build a one-two Regen, which is sort of the basic Armstrong radio. We'll do something with minimal parts count, so you're not going to go crazy trying to find things. I like to use 
the power output tubes from the old from the 1950s battery radios. And the reason is that you wire those as a triode and they make a pretty good substitute for something like a WD-11 or a 201A or a 30, which are hard tubes to come by and also tubes that draw a lot of filament current, so that complicates your power supply situation. This leads you building a radio that the power considerations are going to be real easy, a D-cell and a couple of 9 volters from the dollar store, and you're all set. And so, step one, build a crystal set. Now, any radio, the tuned circuits are the heart of the matter. And that's the hard part. So, you can wind your own coil, you can find a construction article, wind a coil as they tell you to wind, or you can get coil out of an old radio, you can put coil to a, to a 20s or 30s set, will work just fine here. Tuning capacitor, another variable capacitor to connect to the antenna, that's the easy way. Diode on the old 2000 ohm headset over here. My one comment here is if you have a coil that you can get a center tap out of, hook the diode down there, it'll work a whole lot better. But you can build a radio like this with no test equipment, Look into the antenna, you'll almost surely hear some local station, and you can satisfy yourself that you have, for instance, the right number of turns on your coil, and you can actually tune things and hear things. Okay, so our next step, we'll take that circuit, and we'll <coughs> jack up the germanium diode, and we'll drive a tube underneath. So, <coughs> keep getting the wrong button. So you have your tube here, uh, screen grid to plate, that makes it into a triode. Uh, if it's a 1S4, then you have a D-cell down here to light up the filaments. You're going to want to switch here to turn the filament off so it doesn't drag the battery down. Uh, grid leak resistor out here, about 1 meg ohm, and a bypass cap around that, about 100 puff. And two or three... Like I say, dollar stored uh, nine burgers work just fine over there. And there you got a radio. It'll work a whole lot better than the crystal set. Uh, and uh, so that's step two. You're still doing this on the tabletop, okay? Step three, now it gets a little more complicated. You have to solve the problems associated with adding a tickler coil out here. Now remember, John Hogan there with two coils laying on the table, moving them around to figure out what was the right distance, what was the right number of turns. You can do this, and like I say, it doesn't require a whole lot of test equipment. And uh, so you have the tickler coil. The easy way to control regeneration is just to have a, re a, a variable resistor shunting the thing. The resistance goes down, the feedback goes down, and it doesn't squeal. Uh, and in this case, you'll need a bypass capacitor across the, the headset in order to have the thing oscillate right. So there it is, and it's that simple. It's just a handful of parts, and like I said, you can build it up with clip leads or just tack solder things together and get the thing going. So uh, that's sort of the place to start if you want to go you know, one step beyond a crystal setter, in this case, two sets beyond a crystal setter. Uh, yes. Coil, yes, it does. And if it doesn't work, you flip it over. <laughs> Al, has anybody ever measured the sensitivity and selectivity? And how high up in frequency could you go to, let's say, 160 meters or 80 meters? Oh, now? sure. Uh, uh, a simple circuit like that. I have to be retrained every time I use this thing. Simple circuit like that will give a good account of itself even well up into the short wave range. Uh, short wave broadcast stations are monstrously strong, and the antenna you put up is starting to look like a quarter wave on 31 meters, so you have all kinds of signal. Sometime, sometimes with broadcast radios, it's all you can do to keep the short wave out of them. And then, if you start talking about amateur use, especially CW, uh, a regen receiver is actually not very sensitive when you're using it for AM, mm -hmm. because this grid circuit here is, is rectifying pretty much the way 
a diode does in a crystal set, and then you have some audio gain through the tube. But it's a square law, a square law detector. Now that means that every time the input signal doubles, the output signal quadruples. That sounds like a good deal. But when it goes the other way, when the input signal is cut in half, the output signal falls off by a factor of four. So you go in, you go down in the noise real quick. So regens really aren't that good for AM. But when you make the thing regenerate, now it's a linear detector. And you can hear CW signals really well. And you can benefit then by putting audio amplification out the back of the thing here and have it work. So that's that's what I that's what I'd suggest. You know, you can uh, we'll, we'll talk about construction details in a moment here. But. No. No. Yeah, it's just a question. In the tuning circuit, did you want to maybe talk about possibly using coupling, you know, as opposed to just tuning the entire... Uh, I, I, really, I really didn't want to talk about anything at this point. The selectivity? Yeah, I mean, just, just the simplest... I was keeping this the simplest case where, uh, where we have an on-tapped coil... I mean, you can have taps in the coil, you can have primaries, you can have all kinds of stuff there that, that would work better. But this is a good place to start. It's not complicated. You're not going to get all bogged down in a lot of complications. By all means, if you want to build a good radio, go read the books, find something attractive and build it. But the, the tune circuit there is going to be the heart of it. And that's going to kind of set the scene for how well the thing's going to work. Okay. Talk about construction a little bit, and uh, uh, this is a simple construction methodology. We use this for the crystal sets we did for the, the crystal clinic. Three-quarter inch plywood or a three-quarter inch shelving board, and tempered masonite comes in eighth inch thicknesses at the home store. It's like eight or nine dollars for a four by eight sheet. <coughs> It's a reasonable facsimile for Bakelite. I mean, it's not as fancy as Bakelite, but it doesn't cost any money either. So you cut a panel, if you mess it up, you cut another panel. It works pretty well. You spray some black paint on it, and somebody will have to scratch it to tell that it's not Bakelite. Uh, if you use a variable capacitor that just comes out to a big fat knob, it's easy to mount the thing. You don't have to worry about dial drives or any of that kind of stuff. And there you can build a radio. This design's on the website, by the way. And you can take this, add the tube back here in the corner, and make a, make a tube set out of it. Another simple, uh, simple construction of a radio. This was a crystal set I built for Rob down at the Howell Farm a couple of years back. And this thing is just pieces of masonite, two by four, I mean, one by two wooden strips. I made the bottom of it out of plexiglass so you could marvel over the inside of it. The coil was on a uh, traditional oatmeal box here. It was crystal set. Uh, same crystal detector is on this radio up here made out of a fan of stock clip. That's real easy to, real easy to do. For <laughs> you get a little more elaborate in construction, you might want to put the thing in a box. Uh, this radio has a bake line <coughs> front panel. Uh, I'll get this right button here yet. Um, a while ago, I found a bunch of these nice wooden boxes for a dollar a piece that had terribly expensive accelerometers in it at the space program. I, we're, we're still paying for it, you know. But uh, real nice little boxes. I think some nice wooden boxes at the dollar store. The old cigar box is a good, pretty good place to start. All of this is sort of assuming that you don't have the inclinations or the equipment to, you know, to actually build something from scratch. One of the advantages of putting something in a box like that is you close it up, it's protected, <clears throat> it's going to last for a while. If you did a good job, you, you might be proud enough to put your 
your name and a date on here. And, you know, that gets closed up. You give it to your kids. It'll be around 100 years from now. Somebody will open it up. Yeah, oh, wow, Walt Eskies built this in 2008. It's an antique now. What was that, about 110 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> details, no bother. <laughs> but it wouldn't work. Hundred years from now, there'd be no more. No, that's nothing to listen. Well, that's what he was saying. Oh, but that's that's a detail. <laughs> we can, yeah, we can still build a transfer. We can still build a transfer. So let's talk a little bit about a little bit about mechanical fabrication. Uh, a long time ago, somebody told me these are the steps. You cut the piece to shape. You file it to size. You hammer it so it fits. Then you paint it to cover the whole thing up. <laughs> Uh, talk a little bit about laying out things like a front panel. Now, in the old days, we take a, a quadro pad, you know, a piece of graph paper, draw a rectangle on there the size of the front panel, lay it down on the table, put the knobs and switches on top of it, push them around until you have a nice layout, mark the positions on the graph paper, and then that gets taped or glued to your panel, you center punch each hole, and you're all set. Uh, nowadays, here in the 21st century, computer graphics really makes these things easy if you have an appropriate program. Uh, this was the, uh, the front panel for the, uh, the City Mouse crystal set I built, built a couple of last year. And what I did here in Corel Draw was, for instance, this switch had this diameter behind the panel and a knob like that in the front. This rectangle was the tuning cap, uh, tuning knob and the skirt of the tuning knob, mounting hole for the tuning cap. Uh, this was the family stock clip for the detector, that was the detector itself. Anyway, I made these as individual objects that you could kind of shuffle them around until you like the layout, print it out, glue it to the panel, center punch the holes. And away you go. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> and, and, and accurate. <laughs> okay, let's let's but let's let's make devil happy. Let's talk about quick and dirty layout. I mean, the the, the traditional way is you take your square and you take your piece of work. And you scribe a line on it in one direction, to, and then scribe a line in the other direction. You can make a line of holes or whatever. Uh, an old Indian trick taught to me by a guy years ago was this. If you have a cheap pair of vernier calipers, you, know, you don't want to do this with your brown and sharp dial calipers that cost 100 bucks. But you know you can put an inch on here scribe a line an inch down the thing. You want it an inch in from the corner, you go like that, now you've got marks. And you can lay out a square piece of stuff pretty quickly. Just like that. Is that fast enough for you, Devil? <laughs> okay. Close work. You're talking about close work here, gentlemen, and none of us are getting any younger. You know, is, is, is that hole an eighth of an inch or three sixteenths, or is it five thirty seconds? Okay, and these are, you know, there's your steel rule, and there's hundredth of an inch marks, and well, you, you need one of these. Just just face up to it when you see one. You know. It, it really helps. You can't, you can't do good work if you can't see what you're doing. End of story. I have, to say, I have glasses now by my workbench because I, you know, I can read newspapers when I go down to solder. Yeah, I yeah, to, because you're, I mean, that's stuff we did when we were kids. Yeah. You know, you can't, can't do, do that anymore. Can't you do that anymore. <laughs> Okay, let me show you a couple of my favorite tools. We talked about this guy. Um, the old Klein tool, that's a pretty good wire strippers, terminal crimper and things, but the thing I really like about it is 
There are threaded holes on here so you can cut machine screws off the length. If you've got a one inch screw and you need a quarter inch screw, you screw it in here, bob it off, and it cleans up the threads when you take it out. If also, just if you save the, uh, the ones you cut, sometimes you'll get a knob that will be missing its set screw. Mm -hmm. And you can chisel yourself a little notch in that leftover piece that you right. cut off. So save the pieces <laughs> in your junk box. <laughs> and make set screws. Right. Make your own set screws. Does everybody know about nibbling tools? Yeah. You drill a 3 8 hole, you stick this in, and you can just nibble out whatever, whatever hole you want. That's helpful. Uh, <clears throat> tapered reamers are good. Uh, you try to drill a, ha a quarter or a half inch hole. The drill, especially the hand drill, the thing's going to walk yeah, on you and things. Close. Drill a little hole and then ream it out and, and maintain some, <laughs> some accuracy. Uh, what came from McMaster Car? Whose was this? Oh, yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> Picked up tools I didn't know I had. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, Greenlee punches. Now they're expensive, but if you see them laying around at a fest or something, buy them up. Uh, if you if you desperately need one, just get up, get on the reflector and say, "Hey, I need to borrow an infinite inch and eighth Greenlee punch." You know, somebody will help you out. Uh, you can drill a three eighth hole, put this in, tighten it down with a wrench, and cut a nice clean hole in sheet metal, and a whole lot easier than than messing around with this and files and whatnot. Oh, this file, by the way, is nice and straight instead of tapered like a lot of them. And one side of it is smooth. So if you have a hole, you're trying to get a square corner in it, and you're not chewing in two directions at once. So you find a file like that, grab it. My favorite tool of all of these is this guy. Now, how many people have or have access to table saws? Okay, a fair number. This is, this is a panel cutter, and it's homemade. You take a piece of, piece of Luan, you screw a one by two to it, you cut a piece of hardwood that will fit in the slot in the tabletop, you put one screw in it, you put this into the slot, you take your square and get this all squared up so this is <coughs> perpendicular to the blade. Finish screwing that down, and you make this oversized. Now you run this right through the saw, so the edge of the panel cutter is right but against the saw blade. Now, when you want to make square things, like the front panel on that radio, you just flip them on here, you run them through the saw. You can cut small pieces nice and square, and if you have a carbide tip blade, which almost everybody has in this day and age, you can cut aluminum, no problem. Wow. Yeah, wear, wear safety glasses. Pieces fly around, but you could, this is, like this is, this might, yeah, this might even be eighth inch, I was thinking it was 90 thou, but, but you can just saw right through it. And with something like this, you can make nice square pieces. That lets you do things like this. Now. The, the, the main chassis here was some piece of surplus stuff that already had hinges and a latch and things on it. But the front panel was cut out that way. This panel to mount the vernier drive was cut out that way. And there's some tricks like the mounting holes here and everything. You clamp those two things together and drill the holes all at once so that everything lines up. And spacers either threaded spacers or through spacers mm -hmm. with long bolts mm -hmm. are the way to make that kind of a, an assembly and do it easily. So it's pretty... Um, Sears has a lot of that uh, hardware. I mean, I don't know if you know, people look around for that, but they, they do have a pretty good selection and you can usually find that stuff on it, you know. It's hardware has a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah, and of course, junk boxes are the answer to a lot of the problem, but uh, you may or may not have it. Um, you can take a look later. This was a 
crystal set I built a while back got carried away. But again, I found an ice box that used to have a, uh, a Wheatstone bridge in it and built uh, a, I, well, I tell people that's, that's, that's a 1% one, one that's a, a 99th percentile crystal set. Okay, you run into 100 crystal sets, that's going to be better than 99 of them, maybe maybe a bunch more than that. But it's a good set. Anyway, let me see. It's stereo. Hey, it's stereo. That's how good it is. <laughs> so, uh, we'll do a little discussion here. Anybody have questions, comments, things you want to know? Are you going to build a radio? Get busy and build something. Uh, yeah. Oh, now, this presentation, this little, do you have that on your website? Because you had some good stuff that I downloaded from your website. There's, there's um, like this one. The, the, oh, background, this the background of a lot of this stuff is on my website. And uh, there's links to the, there's links to a lot of it out of the New Jersey site. Or if all else fails, Google Al Place, and it'll be about the third one down. Yes? Uh, for supplies and parts, Route 22, Greenbrook Electronics has in stock a lot of the flat sheets of aluminum. It's like surplus. It's like five bucks for a sheet. And you can cut that up with your saber saw the way I do, or you can use it to do it the right way. That, that's a good point. Greenbrook is almost the only electronics yeah. distributor we got left. He also has, if you want to work with, and I've, I've been working with it lately, and I'm very happy, is double cladded plastic, um, um, I guess you'd call it PC board, it's got copper on both sides, so you can solder the pieces together and build yourself a nice little chassis without too much, without using bolts. Mm -hmm. And if you use a block, you can square things up. And, you know, it's easy to drill. You can use your wooden drill set to go through it because it's very, very uh, soft. And uh, it's copper, so you can sheen shine it up, and it really looks kind of flashy. So it's another recommended material you might want to try if you know if you're looking for something, and it's shielded too. So you know you can build a nice uh, uh, enclosure. And he has that. Yeah, it's like fourteen dollars for a big one by one sheet. Okay, and one other suggestion: if you don't, if you're going to have just one book on how radios work and how to build them, that's it. Radio Amateur's Handbook. Uh, Ray's got a couple of them back there for sale. Uh, <laughs> covers almost every aspect of of what we're doing here. I was just curious, do they still have those books? No? I mean, are they still yeah. producing those books? Yeah, just, okay. they're, they're, they're bigger and right. I, they I have digital it. stuff in them and things, but there's still a radio amateur's handbook, and uh, I'd recommend any of them. But the, you know, the vintage, vintage ones are neat, the ones before 1970. They've got all the old ads in the back and stuff like that. Anything else? How do you live without a Dremel tool? I have a Dremel tool. Okay. I, I wasn't going to talk about exotic things. <laughs> that's not exotic. That's that's like the yes the tool. tool. I asked the machinist a while back about how you try the line on the panel. Uh huh. Said, yeah, you keep your old pair of pals. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I had the good fortune to have done done model shop work in the old days and worked with some machinists and old time radio guys and things and that's where you that's where you learn stuff like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, on your uh, triode equipment, the one S four or whatever. Right. Go back to the diagram. Sure. How do you, how do you identify the different uh, the different grids? Is it the screen grid you yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, let's go with this. Yeah. Okay. So there's three grids. There. There's three grids. The, the control grid is the first one up from the cathode. Right. So that's where your signal comes in. The second one is the screen grid, which, if you're running it as a pentode, is is it an electrostatic shield between the two halves of the tube. But we're going to run it as a triode, so you connect the screen grid to the plate. In most of these tubes, the suppressor grid is internally connected to the filament, so you can't really do anything with that. But you tie the screen to the plate, and then it's a triode. Now, what, what the problem is, uh, you'll see people build radios with like 1T4s, RF pentodes. Those tubes want to see a plate load over here of about a mega ohm instead of the 10,000 ohms or so of a headset. 
So taking one of these tubes and making it into a triode for a simple circuit is a much, a much better deal. Couldn't you put a resistor, though, to bring it up? And then to the value, and then the audio amplifier. Well, as, 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 soon as, you, as soon as you put a resistor in here yeah. and run that as a screen, then the impedance of the plate yeah. circuit yeah. gets high. Mm -hmm. And the other thing here is that uh, a lot of the old projects you run into are all triode based anyhow. And uh, uh, this, this scheme works works well, like if you need to substitute for a WD11 or something like that, which are becoming impossible to get. Triode connect with 3D4 or something like that will work just mm -hmm. fine. Sir? Why not just use a modern triode? <clears throat> well, in this case, in this case, yeah. I wanted to run the thing on batteries. Yeah, I'm talking about... Oh, sure. Yeah, you could use a, a 6C4 or something yeah, like yeah. that and just have at it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like I said, the, the, the intent here was to have something that you didn't have to worry about a power supply. Al, I think you had a couple of tubes as it has oh, potentials. Yeah. And was any one better than the other? I think it was a 3B. No, three, no. Three, uh, three, the, 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 ones that are, the ones that are common are the 3S4, 3B4, 3Q4. Okay? And the reason I didn't show that in the drawing was because the, the, draw, the, the pentode I had didn't have a center tap on the filament. Which you have, which you have here. With those, you have your choice of running it on three volts or volt and a half. Mm -hmm. you, you can just put a, put two halves in parallel, run it on one D cell. And you don't need much plate voltage. Maybe 12 volts, 24 volts. 12 volts will even 12 volts will even work yeah. uh, on a regen. On a regen, 20. You know, like I say, three three nine volt is yeah. is, is, good, is good and comfortable. Another ploy, and I have some, some discussion of this on my website. This, this radio is based on one of the 12 volt auto radio tubes that runs with 12 volts on the plate. Back in the 50s, they, before, before transistors were any good at high frequencies, they designed a, a family of radio tubes that had 12 volt filaments and would run with 12 volts on the plate. They couldn't deliver any power, but they'd have a big fat transistor on the hybrid. output of the radio, hybrids. How, how do you get, just in that case, how do you get a space charge from a 12-volt filament up to a plate that's at the same potential? Well, no, it's not, well, it's not really a filament. It's a 12-volt heater. Yeah. And the heater is at ground, <coughs> if you will. Okay. The cathode. The cathode is at ground. So that you've got, there is a There's difference. 12, 12, so there there's 12 volts across the tube, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. I see. Yeah, John. Okay, wow. we're going to take a break, Put that up. about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then we have a 15-minute video. Now, some of you have seen this, but if you want to see homebrew, we have a Frenchman here who makes vacuum tubes from scratch. It's mind-boggling. Thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry. Good night, Phil. <laughs>